Hi, I'm Amy Porter, and this is my podcast. My mission is to show people how to empower themselves through music, business, and media. I try to see as clearly as possible how I can help. I showcase the music that I've played and the people I've met along the way. I'm a wife and a stepmom. You might know me as a professor, a performer, a producer, a publisher, a recording artist. I'm the founder of a couple of nonprofits. Welcome in to my Porter Flute Pod. Welcome to Porter Flute Pod. I can't believe I'm making this podcast. It's season six, episode 11. And I thought I'd take the week off from podcasting, but I wanted to connect with my listeners so much. So I decided to make time in the middle of everything. It's such a crazy part of the year. There's juries, concerto competition, pre-screening 70 flute players for my Michigan studio. I'm practicing for a recital in 10 days. There's Christmas shopping and sending holiday cards. So welcome to season six, episode 11, where I can finally do something I've wanted to do. I'm just going to leave it up to the grab bag. Yes, I've always had this idea that I'd go into my grab bag of advice. I, I actually have two grab bags, and I would call this episode Grab Bag of Life. See, it's in case you hear something that helps you. Okay, so word of caution, it's random, but... I really feel that I've chosen a few things that might be therapeutic, it might be part of my history, it might be a list. So here it is, my grab bag full of advice, and I chose some Christmas nativity music to go along with it. This time my arrangement, all played by me, of Morton Lordson's O Manu Mysterium. You can see it on YouTube. Thanks for being in Porter Flute Pod, I'm so happy you're here. I'm in the grab bag and I'm pulling out some notes from a workshop that I did while I was still in the Atlanta Symphony. It was called Opening Space for Personal and Professional Development, a seminar for women. You know, a lot of the grab bag, it it has a lot of professional development notes in it. So I hope I can share some of this. This first section, though, I'm going to talk about fighting with your inner child and creating a higher self. So the notes I have here are about tending to your higher self and opening up space to deal with that inner child. I did a lot of that work, a lot of that work. I I think uh, we're finding out some things in talking to family members about, you know, the bipolar tendencies that a relative had. And I think that is now, I'm learning that now that I can look at it. So. I worked a lot on the inner child throughout my life, and I just want to say that each one of us has a place where we store unresolved trauma and unmet needs, and that's pretty much coming out in our inner child. It's that personified representation. It's unmet wants and needs, and so when we can kind of look at it like that, we can create a picture of ourselves and we can say, hey, let's communicate with this inner child. Because if we don't satisfy or find a way to resolve that trauma, then that inner child is going to take over our life and run it for us. (laughs) My inner child's run my life for a few years at times and will continue to encounter the same emotions that sit unresolved. And that's, that's the inner child's way of finding resolution. That kind of circle of 
of of nothing. It just it, it keeps re- un- recognizing that its unmet wants and needs are there, and 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 it keeps wanting to be fulfilled. So you need to fulfill what's been unfulfilled. Now, when you can do that. You can find your frequency and tap into it for your higher self. Find your lane. Find your frequency. I love that line. So you open up time to deal with, and space, to deal with this inner child. I want to tell you that it will acknowledge your higher self. You'll be saying, okay, I'm thinking from my higher self because I've learned also Higher self never spends energy or wastes oxygen to create data. Your higher self is a feeding system. Your higher self wants to be a feeding system. So if you're clinging to something, I think reality is going to crash and dismantle all your, you know, if you start to make plans and, 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 get all emotional about it. The actions that are born out of fear, they're not coming from your higher self. And these are the notes that spoke to me and and made me put them in my grab bag. I really hope that this advice in my notes helped you. Open up to your higher self. Again, find your lane, find your frequency. Number two, in the grab bag, the why of classical music. So why would you play classical music? Well, you want a deeper understanding of yourself as a musician. And there's a philosophy of excellence and discipline, and it always leads to higher goals, and then you can achieve those goals. Classical music gives you that feeling that you're achieving something. You have to have a commitment to classical music. It's a cause. And don't stop unless your heart tells you to stop. So to be a classical musician, you listen with your heart when you choose to practice. Why do we practice? Well, we don't want stage fright to set in. (laughs) That's kind of my number one rule but we'd like a deeper understanding of the music and the composer. So we practice with our head and we practice with our ears and many people do the opposite. They practice with their egos listening. You know, I think we have to rethink our musical goals if you find music is too debilitating. If you're saying that phrase, oh, I can't wait till that's over, then you really have to consider what classical music means to you. I'm going to read something from the new Criterion from February 2004, almost 20 years ago. And it's an article by Jay Nordlinger. 
called Tending the Gardens of Music. And I'm just going to read the last paragraph. Eventually, young musicians will teach and create protégés. Hilary Hahn studied with Yasha Brodsky, who studied with Isai and Zimbalist. And so it goes. Our musical institutions will survive because people insist that they do. Not a vast number of people as compared with those who love sports or soda, but enough people. As Sedgwick Clark says, Beethoven, Tchaikovsky, Stravinsky, and the rest will always be performed. Always. There's no doubt about it. And incidentally, I've no problem viewing orchestras, for example, as museums. This is one of the great sneers that our institutions have become museums. They are museums, no less than the Metropolitan Museum of Art or the Museum of Modern Art. And there's nothing wrong with that. That doesn't mean that the orchestras don't play contemporary music. They bring it into the museum, and whether it stays on exhibit remains to be seen. I hasten to add that a museum is not a mausoleum. There's a great life-throbbing, comforting, provocative, glorious life in those musical museums of ours. It pays to remember, too, that people who have been around for a while tend not to sweat the future of classical music. The pendulum swings back and forth, says Gary Grafman, although he has lived through two or three of these round-trip swings. To obsess over the fate of classical music, notes Grafman, is like obsessing over the fate of the stock market. We should take the long view and not get carried away by sharp spikes or sharp spikes down. Echoing our chairman of the Federal Reserve, I might say that both irrational exuberance and irrational gloom are errors to be avoided. And do not, as Gary Grafman says, make the mistake of thinking that the audience is limitless. Always there will be classical music fannies in the seats. Just don't create a ridiculous excess of them. Seats, that is. And allow me a final repetition. Our institutions will not prosper by themselves. One has to work at them. One has to tend the garden of music. And they will indeed grow, or if not grow, at least not die, blooming again every year to one degree or another. America is lucky in its plentitude of gardeners. And the gardens they make, amidst all the hand-wringing, some of it justifiable, we should pause in gratitude to fold those hands as well. Back in the day, we used to cut out articles from magazines. So I have this very small cutout. I think it might be from Flute Talk magazine, but I can't tell you the year and I can't tell you who wrote it, but it's information that is super handy. It's about flutes and weather. And it talks about how violins and oboes and the other wooden instruments, they're greatly affected by changes in temperature and humidity. And even though the modern flutes are made from metal, they're still affected by changes in the weather. So let's talk about that. Warm temperatures can cause metal to expand. So flutists usually pull out the head joint more during the summer to play in tune with other instruments. 
The foot joint and head joint can also swell slightly, making the flute hard to put together. If this occurs, you have to clean the tendons well with a soft dry cloth and remove any dust or dirt. And if the parts still don't fit well, don't force them together. This will damage your instrument. Just take it to a repairman. I know that I take the cloth and I clean inside the body of the flute right where I put the head joint in and then I clean the outside tendon right where I put the foot joint on. Pads can become sticky in humid weather. And this is a less serious problem, but it's annoying. Um, the problem is caused by accumulated moisture or dirt, and you can clean the pad. So put a small piece of cigarette paper underneath. Don't use the edge that's treated with glue. And then you hold the key closed with one hand. Don't slide the paper. You're going to rip your pad if you slide the paper. Just let it absorb. And one other option that I was told was, why don't you ignore it? It'll go away. <laughs> it depends on where you are. Let's talk about corks and pads. I know I've had a terrible cork situation in a piccolo where it's super affected by the, uh, the, the weather in Brevard. So that's always a thrill. Cork stoppers in the head joint and beneath the trill and the E-flat keys, they can shrink in hot, dry air, which affects tone, or it can expand in the humid air. So don't leave your instrument in a car with windows closed in the summer. The extreme heat can make the pads fall out because the glue holding them melts. And the corks and your pads should be replaced by a professional repair person. And to protect it in heat and humidity, you have to keep it in a clean, dry case when you're not playing. I know that I try to keep the instruments in the summer in air conditioning as much as possible. And the summer is a great time to schedule a checkup with a professional and you should get um, a good cleaning and an oiling and an adjustment. We call that a COA. We have a podcast all about that. And so uh, I just think that you should make sure that you're ready for any season with your instrument. I found a list in the grab bag, ways to eliminate unnecessary stress. It's a good list. It's not a funny, it's, it's a good list. Here, here it is. Remember, nobody is perfect, including you. That's a way to eliminate unnecessary stress. I'm not perfect. Okay, here's one. Things change. Expect it. Well, I've always said nothing is more constant than change, right? So expect change. Don't rely on your memory. Write it down doesn't matter how young or old write it down here's a great one enjoy the moment quite often we're looking down at our phones so look up and actually try to look at the sky here's another one choose your thoughts wisely you are the master of your thoughts so choose them wisely are you stressing yourself out? Here's a good one. Accept people for the way they are, not the way you are. And accept people for the way they are, not the way you need them to be, want them to be. Otherwise, you're going to be disappointed. Here's a good one. Eliminate unnecessary stress by getting up 15 minutes earlier. I know it's hard. At night you say, I'm going to get up at 6. And then at 5.30 you're like, well, I get half an hour and then you oversleep. <laughs> well, set an alarm and just get up a little earlier. It's so wonderful. But you already know me and mornings. All right. Keep things simple and uncomplicated. Well, that's kind of hard for me. I think what that means, keep things simple. There's a funnel that you can think about. You want to make your point 
first. So you want to be simple and uncomplicated, and then you can think about more details. But if you have this overarching, so much data and so much information, so many details that you don't even know what you're doing, and it's complicated and it's not simple anymore, dial it back, eliminate that stress, and keep it simple. And recognize what you can't control and let it go. Oh, that's a good one. Recognize what you can't control and let it go. A stoplight. You're at a traffic light and you really need it to turn green. But guess what? It's not going to. Not in your time. You can't control it. So let go of the steering wheel. Take a breath through your nose, out through your mouth. Say hello to the person in front of you and the light will change. All right, talk less and listen more. Well, I appreciate you listening. Talk less and listen more. That's what, (laughs) remember the old adage, that's what it means when, when they say, God gave you one mouth and two ears. Avoid negative people. That's a great one. I did that a long time ago. You can remove yourself from a space. You can turn off a television. If it's negative, then avoid it. Here's one called the no train. Know your limitations and say no more often. Get on the no train. Can you play this for me? No. Can you play in my recital? No. I mean, if it's going to help the person and it's, life or death, then yes. But if it's going to add on to your already tough season of shopping and gigging and grading and, you know, you've just got to say no. All right. Here's a really important one. Learn to meet your own needs. If you're not fulfilling your needs, nobody can. Don't rely on someone else to fill that cup for you. Stop thinking tomorrow will be a better day. Make today better. A lot of the times when people say, Amy, I'm sure you're looking forward to this. I say, oh, no, I'm going to be missing the now. You need to believe that good things happen in the now. And some things just are. So recognize the importance of your moment and the love, the unconditional love that that moment brings to you. Laugh and daydream and understand that the moment you're in is positive and beautiful and you'll be living it in the future. You will. Just eliminate that unnecessary stress and take some time to play. In 2018, I got an email from Sarah. She was a coach. I also knew her as a friend. And so she asked me if I could use some coaching. And at the time I was thinking, I don't know really what that means, but I'm trying to figure out all these personalities that I have. It wasn't like a multiple personality disorder. It was a multiple career disorder. I was all these things in all these places and wearing all these hats. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to sign up with Sarah for six months. We're going to kind of divide the campaigns, so to speak. So we started talking once a week and I learned so much. She would ask me at the end of every session, 
she'd say, what value did you create today in the conversation? Like, what lessons did you learn? And I always learned a lot. And she'd ask, was there anything missing or disempowering? And of course, no, there wasn't. And then she always asked, what could she acknowledge in me? And I think the biggest thing I would tell her is that she charged me to raise the bar again. Like she really was behind me to already raise a a bar that was so high and I needed to sort it all out. So she taught me something I'm gonna share today, uh, some wisdom about prioritizing your projects. You have to ask, is that a rock? So rocks are top shelf projects that are most important at a given time. And you have to be careful not to let the rock get kicked down the road. For instance, I'll vacuum and clean the whole parlor before I practice. Or if you want to get working on your business, but you end up cleaning your desk first, that's kicking your project down the road. So just get your top shelf rock projects going. Pebbles are smaller projects that have to get done, but they're not top priority. Then there's the sand. The sand is the the little stuff, the emails, the social media blasts, all this little stuff that I had to do that I thought was so important, but it ends up just being sand. And then there's water, water, stuff that's imposed on you by other people, personal social media, when you're flipping through your phone and you realize half an hour is gone, that's water. That's tiny little stuff. You give too much time to it. Don't let the big rocks get swept away by the water. She encouraged me to choose the times of day that I wanted to work on smaller tasks and then devote my attention to the important things of the day. I totally do that now, which is, again, why I can't believe that I'm doing this podcast because I guess I'm using her wisdom. <laughs> Here's another thing. She told me to talk, uh, think about what lens I'm wearing. What's my lens? Well, it's kind of how I see myself and how I see myself protecting my own heart. Where am I walking around protecting myself as a person, like not discussing personal stuff with absolutely everything, everyone, or, you know, making a conscious effort to be, be you know, have a smile, I'll keep a commitment to myself. And what lens am I wearing? Like, am I approaching life from I'm not good enough lens? Am I making a lot of mistakes lens? You know, I actually, I've actually grown into this kind of a power. So I've, I've created a, like a a power that I turn on when I walk into a room and I I think I'm going to feel uncomfortable. It has nothing to do with the fear of crowds, but I'm just talking about more like the lens I see myself. So you know, when you can hold yourself up and say, I'm me and this is what I believe in and my personal stuff is my personal stuff. I don't need to wear my heart on my sleeve. I'm good enough. My mistakes are my mistakes and it doesn't make me insignificant. Listen, that's what coaching is about. I I think coming away with all that power just was incredible. Um, The last thing I wanna talk about is the force field the force field that draws people into you. And that's what she told me I had. And that there were some conflicts I had um, from my youth uh, between my joy and my mother's vision of my joy. My mother had a vision of what would be best for me. And even though I followed it, uh, there was always a conflict there a little bit. You know, what else would I be doing? Would I be riding horses? (laughs) <laughs> so I have a great history with music. It brings me joy. I do it for the love, but I had to not, as she said, go dumb. She said, I needed to be where, you know, where I was in my, why am I doing it? And what for, why do I play the flute? And that you have such a force field that you, you need to keep, you know, recognizing your force field and keep connecting with your why, keep connecting with my what for and not doing it for recognition, but more about contribution. 
it was great. I got clear on what would be lost if I didn't play. Um, I got clear on communication. I got clear on my life's work. So uh, I was just so happy to share some of those uh, thoughts with you. It changed everything. Magic is happening now. Um, I, I think she taught me that there's a sweet spot. And if you wait for it, it's not going to happen. <laughs> it won't fall in your lap. You have to combine it with action and change yourself. You know, it's not just action, it's mentality. So I'm going to give away now that amazing website for you to meet Sarah Hollinsworth. Hollinsworth coaching and consulting can be found at sarahhollinsworth.com. S-A-R-A-H. H O L L A N D S W O R T H dot com. She has a website that says holding space for the space holders of the world. She has coachings for individuals and organizations who want to spark intentional change that leads to their ultimate impact. I cannot recommend her more. There they are. There's some morsels of wisdom from the grab bag, my grab bag of life. I know that was fun for me to go through and revisit a lot of that information. It's wisdom. It's inspiration. It's a good old fashioned kick in the pants. Do you have a grab bag? What's in your grab bag? Is it advice? Is it mementos? Is it humor? We'd love to hear from you. You can find us at porterflute.com. You can find me at amyporter.com or amyporterproductions.com. Try AOS-Wellness for your wellness routine. And you can always find me on Instagram, YouTube, Threads, and Facebook as Amy Porter Flutist or Porter Flute. Thanks for being in Porter Flute Pod. I'm so grateful for you.